True. Test one, two. Test, test.
We're going to get started, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Got to get really close. All right, everyone. We're going to get started. If everybody can take their seats, that would be lovely. It's sort of on. Yeah, it's there on on go. one side, but not the other side. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for being here, uh, attending our first grand round for the new semester. Uh, my name is Terry Huang. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Health Policy Management, uh, and I also run uh, the Center for Systems and Community Design. The center is very excited to be hosting uh, this first grand round. Uh, and we're really honored uh, to have Dr. Shelley Bowen uh, to be with us today. Um, I actually don't really know how to introduce Shelly because she has done so many things. Um, I first started working with Shelly down in Australia several years ago uh, when she was a senior public health advisor uh, for the Victorian uh, government. Um, Victoria is the state where Melbourne is located. And um, at that time, she was uh, implementing, redesigning and implementing um, the entire preventive landscape uh, in Victoria, uh, taking a very uh, systems-oriented uh, approach, a place-based approach, uh, to uh, really reinvent um, the prevention workforce um, to address some of the uh, most challenging chronic disease burdens um, in, 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 in Victoria. Uh, and her work was very influential nationally as well uh, and, and internationally um, also. 
Uh, since then, uh, Shelley has left uh, government uh, and started um, a whole new venture uh, called Health Futures Australia, uh, which is really uh, looking to disrupt the system uh, in Australia and beyond. Uh, and she's going to share with us some of the things that she's learned from her prior work, as well as uh, what she's up to these days and how she's going about uh, creating change. Uh, she's currently on a very prestigious uh, social change fellowship uh, sponsored by Westpac, which is Australia's first company and the oldest a banking institution. Uh, and she's touring the US currently uh, as part of her fellowship. So we were very lucky to be able to take advantage of her presence uh, in the US uh, to come in and give this uh, grand rounds presentation uh, and also get some feedback from her personally on some of the initiatives that we're developing here in New York. Uh, so I don't think I need to say any more because you're going to uh, hear all about uh, Shelley's work uh, from her directly. Um, so welcome, Shelley, and we're so excited to have you with us in New York. Thank you. Th hear me okay? Thank you, Terry. Um, it's absolutely delightful to be here. I'm, um, I'm just going to forewarn, I'm experiencing, I'm not quite sure, I'm trying to go through multiple self-diagnoses at the moment of what's going on. Um, the day before I flew, and it's a hell of a flight, who's flown to Australia? Few? Are you over it yet? <laughs> I mean, I do it all the time, but um, I think as you get older, it gets a little bit harder, and um, I had a sore throat. And I thought, oh no, the day before getting on a 21 hour flight, um, which kind of doesn't help really. So I, I think I've possibly got a sinus infection, a head cold, or I've just diagnosed in the last 10 minutes hay fever. Um, unfortunately, it does kind of, when I talk, which kills me because I love to talk, when I talk, I start coughing. So um, just bear with me. If I do start to cough, I'll have a drink of water and we'll be right and we'll keep going from there. So yeah, I'm absolutely thrilled um, to be here and I just get this sense when I walk into to, to this facility of the, the innovation and the energy and I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted and as Terry said, we met a number of years ago. I think actually the moment we met was in Kuala Lumpur and I'd just done a presentation alongside a, a, a former Minister for Health. It was a panel session and a pode from France. We we're really talking about complex community level interventions around tackling childhood obesity um, from around the world. And I remember there was a queue of people asking questions and you know, we're chatting away and then this, this, this dashing man came up to me and sort of started asking me questions about things. I thought, gosh, no one's asked me questions about this before. He's a pretty interesting kind of guy. And then he, said, he introduced himself. I got very excited and the friendships kind of um, blossomed since then really and um, through multiple changes for both of us. So very, very um, exciting. So just a little bit of context. Um, for those that don't know, Australia, that, that's it. It's a nice shape of the country. Um, I come from um, actually lots of different parts. I was born and bred out here, way out in west, um, western New South Wales. Um, we're up on a sheep farm, as lots of Australians that live in the country do, a sheep farm that was for wool, merino wool, um, right on the river. We had about, we had a very small farm. We had about 30,000 hectares. Um, and that's small in Australian terms, particularly as you get further out west. I uh, went to University in Canberra first, undergraduate, I then went off to um, Sydney and did a, both a Master of Public Health, worked in Sydney for a while and did a uh, PhD in public health, looking at the relationship between equity and um, health and uh, uh, evidence and, and government policy. But now I'm in Victoria, I made a big shift to Victoria about about a decade ago, as, as, as Terry referred to, I've been the state's public health advisor there for yeah, almost a decade and in the last 18 months I... Um, I, I, you know, did I, I stepped into the dark side or did I step into the light side? I, I left government. I left all that comes with government, the, the kind of power, the influence, the money, the budget, um, the policy leveraging, just thinking there's got to be a different way. Because in fact, the way things were working really in um, Australia or operating in Australia, I didn't think, um, I, I couldn't really see a strong um, future for the health and well-being of Australians. And I want to go out and try to, as Terry said, disrupt the system and see what's possible out there beyond that. There's my back gut. This was the morning I left um, last week. And this is, I'm not joking, I didn't find this on the internet. I live on um, about 18 acres, about an hour and 15 minutes out of Melbourne, an hour from Melbourne Airport, so I've got access to the world an hour away. Um, and it's green, that's unusual for Australia. In fact, we've had a lot, where I live is about 800 metres, we've had a lot of rain. And this is beautiful because in about a month's time, we're likely to be looking at smoke and fires and bushfires. And that's kind of um, the nature of living in rural Australia. But um, what you see here, um, 
I didn't, they're all looking at me, so I was trying to sneak, take tiny little steps, thinking that the moment they see me, they will just scatter. Um, they're really critical because it's spring now, and so the majority of the are females. I think the way over in the far corner there is a male. Males are much bigger, and most of those females had have joeys in their pouches. And in fact, the joeys were. That's why I tried to get the photo. This could be just fabulous going to America to show you a photo of the joeys all hopping around. But the minute they heard me, everyone scat scatters into mum's pouches. And um, anyway, that, that's the best I could do. But that is what I get to to um, to look at and. Um, every day and, and, it's, and it's wonderful. I do get to live both a, a fairly green life but have access to kind of major, major cities and populations. Um, I just thought I'd introduce my family. Um, they're here with me actually. They're in the big bright lights in New York. Very exciting for a couple of Australian country kids. My son who's 15, my daughter uh, Lila is 13 and I also have my partner here who's Austrian in fact. He's a scientist. He's a population geneticist. He works um, for a Dutch seed company, organic seed company in Australia and he's been working in Amsterdam at the same time has just flown over to join us, which is lovely for the next, for the next few weeks. Um, and, I, and I showed this photo for a number of reasons. It's really, I just, uh, you know, I remember when I was kind of about to have children, everyone said to me, um, friends, one thing you've really got to hope for with your kids is that they never swim. Don't ever, just because they're Australian, don't ever let them swim because it's a bit of an Australian norm to swim. And of course, what have I got? I've got swimmers. My son's 15, he's a national swimmer, and in fact, very excited to be here. He's connecting with a couple of the universities and swim programs at Columbia and um, at Berkeley. So um, very, very exciting. I've also got a swimmer here, in Lilla 13, um, that, that doesn't quite like to race. She thinks it hurts, um, unlike my son who wants to kind of go to the Olympics. So that keeps me busy. I live a very, um, very full day. They're up swimming eight kilometres before school each day which is um, pretty pretty extraordinary dedication because they want to and they love it and um, they feel alive. So part of my mission is how do I create that so everyone gets these opportunities to feel alive and to make choices and to, to be all they can um, in life. I also just snapped this from yesterday really just to tell a story of the diversity of Australia, which I don't think is too, too dissimilar to the US, but here we have um, um, really this is just the day in the life of um, of what's going on with our weather patterns at the moment. That, that's from yesterday. So we have one state burning with bushfires and we have another state just below um, with snow falling. Both are completely out of season and out of character, which speaks to the enormity of the complexity we face um, at the moment as nations really in dealing with these multiple um, um, realities that affect our daily lives. You know, how can we ignore these patterns in terms of the kind of food systems that influence our health, in terms of our health and well-being, you know, one of the major things we worry about in Australia is heat strategy, and how we cope with that as, as a population in terms of public and population health. So I just thought today, rather than just give you a little walking tour of the pictures of all the things around around Australia, we'd, I'd kind of just um, orient to some of the thinking really of where where I've landed and what my experience, I guess, um, has led me to think about. I'll, I'll kind of do a bit of a what I call a gallery tour of some of the work we've done, which I think was probably the most powerful public and population health intervening that, that I've had the privilege to be a part of and to steward it in Australia. But right through to now how I'm kind of orienting what I think is a missing piece, piece of the puzzle in our pop population health effort and how I think, you know, if we really are looking at drawing together two or three, possibly even four theories of change, where are we landed at and wh what does this signal for us? Um, for the future to be the most dynamic, capable, and um, cutting cutting edge public health practice groups that we that we can be, and I think that hopefully there's some insights there, equally for the US that there, that there are for Australia. Um, don't worry too much about all the writing. Um, I, I'm a not for profit startup, 12 months in, um, and not starting with funding, starting to build funding. So you know, haven't got the kind of everything polished and, and, and fabulous, but, but we're getting there. And in fact, I. I think the term is um, rapidly scaling um, startup, public health startups. So it's quite exciting. We've got um, lots of work, lots of opportunity. So it looks like we've kind of hit the mark, but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about us in a little while. But that's Professor Rob Moody. I don't know if anyone in the room knows Rob. He's a professor of global health um, out of Melbourne University. He's my board chair. So he and I and, and a whole bunch of other um, loyal supporters are saying, yeah, there's got to be a different way. Let's do something different. Let's provide a public health entity that challenges the system, that specialises in transforming the system and enabling and activating new forms of leadership across the system. 
we think we have got the interventions right. I, I, I don't truly believe the interventions are the problem. I think that scaling them and dealing with them for the time we require and iterating them constantly to get better and better and better, not worse and worse and worse. Um, I think they're our, our fundamental public health challenges, but I'll, I'll talk more about that. Um, here you go. So this is Healthy Together Victoria. Um, Terry mentioned this. Is you know, who's had that dream intervention, that dream, other than your fabulous jobs here now, that dream intervention and that dream opportunity in your career? We thought, wow, the planets have aligned. I'm going to be able to make a difference. Has anyone had that opportunity? Yeah, some nods. Yeah, it's pretty exciting, isn't it, when you get that opportunity? We had this in in Australia. Um, up to about two years ago, we had this pure period of a, as a nation of the National Partnership Agreement on Preventive Health, where there was a commitment for us, a population of 25 million people, a commitment of a billion dollar investment in the health of, of our nation. It was very exciting. That money was uh, on a resources distribution formula um, given to the states and territories, you know, Victoria being one, one such state. Um, to position and design, and we had two years to design the type of intervention, the type of reform, the type of future we would want to see for our state and for our nation. And in Victoria, that landed on Healthy Together Victoria, a large scale um, system intervention at multiple levels of the system. We had a whole of state, you know, targeting 6 million people intervention, plus we had a randomised comparison trial of 14 uh, communities selected and 14 comparator communities. Those communities reached about 1.25 million Australians. And we had six years of intervening, which for me as a public health person, used to actually getting funding and then being told 18 months later it's gone, it's taken you six months to employ people, you just can't get the intervention time that you need in the system. So we had six years to intervene. And we also had a, a, another grace period of two years where if we reached certain measures as, as states and territories, we'd be rewarded with um, significantly more, uh, more, more funding. And for my state of Victoria, that meant another um, you know, $50 million, which is, is, is kind of decent investment for prevention. So what I've done here, so the foresight map, the UK foresight group, the system, the, the system model, um, we, we lent, we, we kind of um, took to heart really that we needed to move the system away from the individual through to looking at um, interventions that were multi-pronged, dynamic, and in fact, I used to always say, unless there's 150 things happening at once, we will not shift this population. So it's get your skates on, roll your sleeves up and get ready for something extraordinary. That's going to ask of each of us something very different. No matter what our discipline, our training, our history, we have to work in a very different way. And that at one time was how we mapped the levels of intervening in the system that we were doing at a state level. It was frenetic. We had leadership development occurring. We had um, infrastructure development like the Victorian Health Eating Advisory Service. We had um, um, local government guidelines being developed for how you design healthy communities. A whole range of things that we knew from a public and population point of view uh, were the things that worked, but doing them all together, high scale, high prevention dose for, for an extended period of time. That, that was kind of what what we were up to and kept very busy. And then if you can have a look, so one of our 14 communities was Mujura. Mujura is in the far north, far north east, uh, west of the state, a population of about 50,000 people, quite a high Aboriginal population, which is um, unusual for, for Victoria, um, very isolated, but also Victoria is so important to the nation as it produced so much um, of our food, our fresh food, our fresh produce. Victoria grows grapes and oranges and lots of green vegetables. Um, and in fact, what you'll see in Mildura is endless number of trucks getting all the produce, driving 600 kilometres away to deliver the produce to a whole range of supermarkets who then package it. And guess what they do with it then? They bring it all back <laughs> to Mildura. Is that system working? So Healthy Together Mildura planted a team and the team were quite different. We weren't asking for health promotion officers or public health officers, we were ask, asking for system change agents. People who really understood and wanted to work on changing the system with a whole range of, of different capabilities and I'll come back to those. And then, you know, here we are two years in, this is what Mildura looked like. Something was shifting. You could see it, you could feel it. Evaluation was showing us something extraordinary was happening across this system. We were moving to a tipping point. It was really quite exciting. 
we had a whole, you know, as evidenced in the media system and the conversation that was happening, it's not an attack on McDonald's, of course, but, you know, lots of narration happening in, and, and really fantastic discourse. We had parents rising in groups. We had um, an amazing conversation and community movement building right across our state saying enough is enough, power to the people. We want to make choices about our food system, not have them made for us. So just imagine this is all happening, completely exciting, and then the system kind of falls apart. So it gives people like me this moment to reflect what's going on here. The government changes. Is that a familiar concept for you guys? The government changes. So an intervention two thirds of the way through every marker and measure, a $10 million evaluation, research and evaluation program around it, a whole new center set up to measure and monitor it. It's dynamic and agile. Um, you, you, you see the election, the shock election results, the government changes in the state of Victoria followed six months later by a change in the federal government, which has huge implications, the funding is cut. So here we are holding one of the, I believe, and I must admit I'm biased, but Terry said it too, <laughs> one of the most promising interventions in the world was literally cut overnight. So that moment for me of sitting back going, what more is it gonna take? There's, you know, there's evidence, there's you know, everything that I thought every box was ticked. I thought it was, you know, um, future proof. I didn't think it could go away, but it did. Um, reflecting on that, that big intervention, the things that I think it taught me was that the level and type of leadership required to do this sort of work is unprecedented for we public health people. Agile, adaptive, dynamic, bold, brave, disruptive leadership. But how do we build a community of those kinds of leaders? So you're not alone. I was often alone, but all of a sudden I looked up and there was 500 just like me because we'd done a whole bunch of very dynamic um, engagement strategies, learning strategies, network strategies, and we were feeling that something special was emerging here. It was, you know, power to the people. No amount of public health evidence was gonna pull this one off and it didn't on this, on this occasion. We also learnt that the systems are so varied. Systems are such a throwaway term. I'm sure it's not in the US. I'm sure it's fully understood. Um, in Australia, people talk about it in all sorts of kinds of ways. Groups started to engineer them. Um, others said it was just crazy and we've been doing it forever. Um, the, the fact of the matter is it's a lot of things. It means a lot of things. And the way that I best navigated this and, uh, as an insight for the future was that systems can be causative. The systems we know, the alcohol, the planning, the media system, et cetera, um, systems, in and of themselves are places to intervene, schools, workplaces, early childhood services, hospitals, you know, so we design our interventions for those settings. But also we have um, in Australia three levels of government that fundamentally operate a system. Their systems for intervention as well as their, their systems that design uh, um, um, the planning of, of communities and of our state and of our nation. So fundamentally learning that systems are generative, dynamic and fundamentally human. And then in fact, any big system design needs to consider and work across these, certainly in the Australian context, these three different interpretations of system, at least. Um, the other thing I found incredibly useful, but challenging, you know, I've been, I've been I'm, I'm a public health uh, person through and through, I'm a preventologist. I'm, I'm highly trained in public health to understand it, to look at what, what that means, when it goes with that, when it goes with that. Um, highly trained to understand the data and, and you know, the epidemiology and the evidence interpreting it. Um, but what I wasn't prepared for was this level of complexity. This level of complexity demanded something else. And really, I think the system, certainly um, in, in Victoria and probably you know, nationwide, very much still stuck on what I call the simple and all the complicated. We were still trying to engineer the system. We we're still trying to write plans and guidelines. Um, really and in, in interpreting that this challenge was so simple that we just needed to do another plan or another 10 step guideline and largely that, that, that's been the history I think of health promotion in Australia. Um, complicated I think you know really was just about good practice. Well those comments that we've been doing system interventions forever, we know what to do and you have this part and this part and this part. Again this was far greater than, than those intervening, uh, just looking at how we put a system together and pull it apart and change some of the dynamics. And I really appreciated the Kinevin framework, um, Cognitive Edge coming out of um, the work of Dave Snowden in, um, um, in Wales. Um, took me a while to get my head around it, but really when I, I, I kind of um, embraced this, this take on complexity, it taught me that, that practice is emergent and how do we skill ourselves up 
to operate in a highly emergent world? What are the tools, resources and capabilities we need um, uh, to navigate the future as it emerges, not, not always look back? So, you know, this was, wow, for me, a moment of how do we reframe and start to probe sense and respond to, to what's going on out across our intervening in the system? Um, and I think the other powerful insight for me and I've where I've landed right now is, you know, um, what's the kind of new economy that we want to be a part of what we, and play a role in in public and population health. And um, one that clearly is seeing from my perspective that, that, that kind of government intervention and market mechanisms not working for people, not working for health and wellbeing. And in fact, you know, if we, I think we move now into an era, era where we are, capable of seeding and prototyping new collaborative forms and economic forms that have well-being at their heart, well-being measurement, well-being movement, well-being leadership. And I think this is powerfully where we certainly we need to go in Australia. And it's reinforced by these fabulous people. Um, Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrina Jakobitsky, I can't quite say it. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, and of course, Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand. All of Australia wants to move to New Zealand at the moment. Um, we, you know, we want it to kind of join up somehow. <laughs> um, you know, and I think what these three women alone as part of a collaborative they have formed themselves, called the SIN network of um, Scotland, Iceland and New Zealand, um, is really about bringing well-being back into the work of, of, of modern governments. And most importantly, where is the compassion? You know, where is the empathy that we need to consider in the way we design what we do. And I've drawn a lot on Otto Sharma out of MIT. He's you know, just up the road. So who, who knows Otto Sharma? I've looked at Otto Sharma's work. I think this is probably the other part of the missing public health puzzle for me. If you, okay, if we're gonna to start to talk about empathy, compassion, and from my experience that, you know, when there was mountains of evidence, mountains of goodwill, people moving, excitement generated, something still didn't nail this this kind of public health intervening at this level of scale. And when I landed that I think it is around people feeling this and actually owning this and valuing this as the important work that we all have to do. So how does it become the important work or the important consideration for all of us and not just a public health person or a health promotion um, officer? And what I love about Theory U is that I think it guides us away from that public health trap of okay, we've got a problem at the top of the U over there, to quickly, let's go straight across. Call the people in the room, have a meeting or two, set up a task force, and there's the solution. It's far more complex. It takes much more time. But how do we get people to a moment of presence in this complexity where they feel it, they own it, and they too, hand on heart, want to do something about it? rather than a, you know, a, a, a room of blank faces saying, yes, the evidence is interesting, let's do a small project, let's invest $10,000 in it. Well, actually, no, let's, let's prototype a new form of wellbeing for our communities and for our economy. So I love this because at the moment I'm working across different parts of um, Australia, mostly in Victoria at, at, at the minute, really trying to take people through the U, really trying to get us down to this bottom part, which is presence. Are we in this? What is myself? What is my work? And I proposition that this is the kind of stuff that's missing um, in our public and population health, and it's time to bring it back. And we're certainly making a big effort. I, I won't go into too much detail, but encourage, um, encourage you to look up the work of Otto Sharma and the Presencing Institute. Um, so after all of this kind of soul searching, I, I think I took long service leave out of government and thought if you can't crack it on this occasion, yeah, what, what does the future hold? And um, you know, one of your, your four fa founding fathers um, in those words is, yeah, you just got to get on and do it. You can't wait. And I think there's this um, preoccupation in Australia of um, constantly waiting for the government to give a signal. And I know that, that sounds very different to the US, but our public and population health effort, and in fact, our health care effort relies on government. We wait for government to tell us what to do. We wait for the funding. We all sit back and go, oh, there's no funding, so we can't do anything. And I know that that, that appears to be very different over here. So, you know, let's just innovate. Let's be entrepreneurial. Let's pull people together, take people through Theory U. Let's work out what we can do together. Let's see what we can unlock in the system together. And so that's very much where um, 
where I'd landed with Health Futures Australia. And so about um, only about 12 months ago, I suppose, I'd worked independently for a little while and realised that, you know, I was starting to, I didn't want to be part of the business as usual, public health in Australia. I didn't want to, I could, you know, potentially make a very prosperous career out of being a planner, public health planner, and I could do, do lots of that. But I actually personally believe that planning is killing us. I think it's a default for getting on with action often. Um, and so how do we shift into something that can mobilise, transform and disrupt? And, and so he was born Health Futures Australia, which um, this changes all the time. And the beauty of being, um, being me and in my position right now is I have no bricks and mortar. I have no um, big institution. I have a fantastic board who's dynamic and just are backing me to kind of get on with it and to raise the conversation. And um, very much our future, we believe, is in and around the value of prevention in Australia and really raising the profile of that value. And importantly, creating ma mandates for prevention and public health through leadership, a whole lot of design work, um, a whole lot of rethinking work, right through to, <coughs> excuse me, how we invest in prevention is probably the number one. This is the biggest failing. We set up big interventions and we never worry about its financing. Um, and we, as I said before, we rely on government to finance. That's got to shift. Potentially government can cede it, potentially government may, may not but who is in the marketplace that can invest in prevention for the future. Um, right through to wellbeing communities, which is our big mothership of an intervention, 100 Australian communities reaching 4 million Australians by 2025, undertaking that prevention mandating, that investment design, everyone in the room co-designing the work ahead and co-investing in the work ahead. Right through to um, our newly launched experiments around prevention entrepreneurship, leadership and health futures entrepreneurship, which is that kind of seeding work of innovation and ideas. And how can we broker a different future? How can we design an investable future in the health and wellbeing of Australians? Um, so largely our, our funding now comes through consultancy and contract services. And as a not-for-profit charity in Australia, it's great because you can bring in money to, set, to build the business. Um, do we want to be there for always? No, we need to diversify our sources. And that's what we're doing at the moment, particularly over here through our learning and development and our um, membership-based programming, particularly here. We've been running quite a lot in this space. I'll, I'll land on that in a moment. Um, so as an example, we have three what I call case studies or three areas of work underway. Most is self-generated out of people kind of calling me saying, our system is stuck. We, we don't know what to do. You know, we saw Healthy Together. We were a part of Healthy Together. What are we going to do? Um, next, you know, we're all just sitting like rabbits in the headlock. We don't know what to do. And so we started in a whole variety of ways. And in fact, we've got a beautiful natural policy experiment here in that we've got a rural part of Victoria over here. You'll see the rural regional communities called the Central Highlands, six local governments or municipalities, which is kind of how we operate in Australia. That's where we, we measure, we intervene from a population health point of view in our local government areas, particularly in uh, Victoria and New South Wales. Um, it reaches about 200,000 people, but one municipality has 3,000 people, one has 110,000. So you get that, that stratified population look across regional, um, a regional um, community. We've got the east of Melbourne, which is right from the inner city of Melbourne, right out to the Dandenongs and the mountains and tourist areas. So it's highly diverse, about one and a quarter million people, six municipalities. And we have just south to the southeast, which is the most fast, one of the most fascinating regions, I think, in Australia in that three incredibly diverse populations. One population, a municipality of 200,000 has, uh, I think, um, something like, you know, uh, 150 language groups. It's the biggest manufacturing sector in Australia. Um, and the other two in, alongside of it are the two highest growth municipalities in Australia. So incredible diversity here for a powerful, powerful story that we are building. And we're doing a whole bunch of different work across from early leadership design with hundreds of people in the room going through Theory U, really kind of sense making. Uh, we do dialogue interviews, we do learning journeys, we do system mapping, um, right right through to, to you know, um, early design of what a new system might look like and how we invest in it and where could that investment come from. Um, that's just the theory you with the, in, the types of methods overlaid. That shows you, um, and some of them we've adapted and developed out for ourselves, but basically it's about creating really a, a, a different level of, um, I think, social and economic thought um, that, that I think is nothing short of you know, significant value add to our public and population health practice. Co-initiating, we set up. How do we set up? How do we deeply engage? 
Um, we, we engage through dialogue and synthesis and sense making and holding. I think it's probably the hardest thing for me to do as someone who's a, a public health person, it's not to tell everyone what to do, because in most of my career I've paid to tell people what to do, particularly ministers and governments. Um, right now I'm holding and it kills me. Um, because I, we need people to work out what they've got to do. That's where the real power shifts in the system, is when people design their future with different inputs to give kind of pointers to, what, to where things can head. We make do a whole lot of sense making, system mapping, um, and get to the, probably the most difficult space here at the bottom, the sense of presence in the system. This is my problem. Oh my goodness. The way I've managed my 10,000 employees, the way I've managed and led my organisation, I'm part of the problem. Um, right through to, you know, then kind of hand on heart, I, uh, open heart, open mind, open will. I'm in this to make a difference. Let's move up here. Let's start to prototype, experiment, iterate and see what's possible. And we have across those three case studies of work at the moment, uh, lo lots of different placement along here, really. Uh, but I can't describe the amount of work and how hard the work is to get to presence because everyone wants a solution over there. They want Terry Wang to do something about it and they want someone else to do something about it and they'll give $5,000 for you to fix the world. But really getting to here is where we start to un unlock something quite extraordinary where you're seeing for us in Australia, health insurers, the banks and others around the table saying, oh, I had no idea that this is, I can actually influence this system so significantly if, if I do A, B, C or D. So, quite a powerful methodology that I think overlays beautifully with our public health theory and science, um, as well as a couple of other theories around um, leadership, agile um, leadership, I think, uh, and adaptive leadership hold, hold the greatest promise. Not unfamiliar to anyone in this room, this one, but it's probably just a reminder that um, um, more than ever, I think, the theory you idea, the idea of us revisiting compassion and our role in, the, in this system, how critical that is. Because when it comes to community now, um, sometimes I just see people's faces drop. I rarely actually talk about obesity, to be honest. So this health wellbeing, um, you know, how active are we? How nice is it to go and walk in this community or not? Um, people don't necessarily want to hear about obesity. And it's such a contentious term for, for, for us at a community level. Um, but everybody wants safe walking places, nice, places to walk, good food system, they want fresh and affordable food, all those things make sense to people. So how we frame is, is really critical, particularly because everyone is feeling, and we know, I mean, look what's happening in New York on Friday and happening similarly in Australia, and we're seeing a rise now in the in incidents of children being stressed about climate. You know, we've got some fundamental, highly interconnected issues that we're dealing with, so I think it's no greater time to visit complexity and compassion to how we collectively make sense of what's ahead of us. And I think for we public health um, practitioners, policy makers, decision makers, how we do that is one of our greatest challenges right now to be relevant. Um, just a couple, of, uh, that's just, you know, <laughs> start up not for profit, uh, try to grow in and show you some of the ideas. Moving from the, I mean, the other part of our work or our remit is trying um, yeah, to disrupt the system, but to provide the template to go forward. And part of that is we're kind of experimenting, looking at what's happening around the world, it's been great to be engrossed today and looking at your your brilliant innovation, the, the, the Firefly innovation. Um, just it's so exciting. We're very much wanting to kind of raise the conversation, the narrative, and give people a sense of this critical mass building to deal with this complexity, climate, health, well-being, environment. Over here, we're starting to to test in the in the markets and what we call prevention immersions, where we really are immersing people two, three days at a time, more or less in the theory of you, the public health kind of knowledge the leadership required, hoping that we kind of start to build a bigger community that are ready to kind of lead on, on, the, on this complexity. And the change making series is master classes where we're getting people to together to have that conversation and myself and, and Professor Rob Moody, because we just think it's missing. There's something quite significant missing in Australia. And it breaks my heart to say this, five years ago, I would have been here saying, yay, Australia's doing cool stuff. Um, I think we slipped and we slid. On, um, on our capacity to prevent, our, on our capacity to public health lead. So it's up to it's up to us to kind of, you know, get, get back in the ring and make stuff happen. Um, we're modelling over here things called Health Futures Labs. We're using lots of social innovation methodology, design thinking you know, out of Stanford and otherwise, making sense of that for our, our context and our world, our part of the world. Um, digital engagement, new methods. How do you mobilise? How do you cut through on the busy? This is what's just extraordinary. People are busy. People are exhausted. How do you cut through with not being another thing, 
but how do you really tap into where people can actively engage? And we're doing quite a bit of experimentation, which is really, really, um, really quite exciting. And um, it really, I just kind of wanted to reflect, uh, to, to, to finish up, um, you know, to create a well-being society, uh, economy, uh, community. I think it's, you know, it's a question now for us in public health about how might we. I don't think we have the answers and it's a constant process of learning, experimenting and then iterating. And I think it is, you know, well-being regions, communities, a well-being economy, right through to being, you know, well-being warriors and activists. I think a contemporary public health capability and capacity effort has to consider these kinds of things. Call them what you wish. Um, bring the fire back into all of us that we can actually demand and lead and steward and host a very different future with our communities. We are the community as well. I think the issue, the area of entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, prevention entrepreneurship is probably one of the most exciting and promising and still to be uncovered. And I think lesson, I think probably the leadership is coming from here, to be honest, um, from what I'm observing um, uh, around the world. And I'm happy to to be to be a part a part of that. Um, and I think the capability sets change. Like I'm, um, I'm just employed two part time people. A great moment for a not for profit startup. Um, and you know, I'm a, I've employed thousands of people in my career: public health officers, epidemiologists, uh, public health managers, uh, political advisors with a public health lens. But this time, I kind of had fun creating two job descriptions. I think this is something I'd kind of said anyway. If you're employing someone now to help you change the world, help you change your community, you know, what would their capability set be? And for me, it's very different to what it was before. It's really these types of capabilities, leading, curating, narrating, being comfortable with not knowing what's ahead. I think these are really, really important things. disrupt but be comfortable and be protected when you do disrupt because it's kind of scary to disrupt and people want to kind of you know target you a bit when you disrupt <coughs> broker experiments at scale you know um, and broker resources be bold and brave to ask for the different forms of resources to pitch to be expert pitches on why this will make a difference why and how might we do this be agile entrepreneurs but also expose the power dynamics that are at play. This is something that hits me because I've completely gone from being incredibly powerful by resources and title to being power now from, through my influence and through my passion and what I'm able to give to public health and to my community and to my nation. But I'm, I am so bent on <laughs> exposing the power dynamic that is at play, who holds power to who, where we need to shift power. And this is a really big chapter for Australia to tackle head on. The mental models, you know, shifting more away from the top of the iceberg, the lunchbox strategies, as nice as they are, they're not going to make a difference. We want the lunchbox strategies, we want them at scale, but we want hundreds of them. But we also really want that the mental models, this leadership, this empathy is, is growing in our system. <coughs> Excuse me. And do it all with empathy. You might say, how the hell is she going to measure any of this? <laughs> well, the answer is I don't quite know, but we're having a good go at it. Now, if that is not one of the most complex logic models ever, um, but it makes complete sense to me. I just, I kind of love this. And, 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 you know, probably half of this emerged from the experience of Healthy Together Victoria. They told us that if you're going to go on about system change, then be prepared for that kind of wild and crazy ride of all the sorts of things you need to, to build on stage one, two, three, four, so very much where we are at now, Health Futures Australia, and being not for profit, you know, we're being contracted. It's funny, I, I left government, and every <laughs> every contract I'm doing at the moment is for government, um, because that's where the state of funding is at in Australia. I hope the future is very different, and I anticipate that it will be. Um, but very much at the moment, we're down here. We're out what we call system engagement. What are the kinds of things you need to do through dialogue, through learning, through perspective gathering, through conversation, how do you start? This is the premise of this logic. You start with system engagement. You walk right up the side here to system transformation. And there's a whole bunch. I won't go too much into detail on that. But at the moment, we've got kind of one evaluation for one of those three three pieces of work underway, which is starting to measure here. What is it? What does it take when you have a consortium for change set up? Where are they at? What are the kind of capabilities they're developing over time? So. Um, yeah, we have, a, we have a logic model and we have some evaluation underway and we're forming some pretty cool um, research partnerships um, 
um, to, to, to drive this kind of work um, much more systemically over time to match the growth of our, our pieces of work. So I kind of land there really and um, hoping um, to sum up with, you know, no surprise it's complex, but it's open complexity. Things are changing, we are but small parts here, all of us in this room. Collective, collectively we're a bigger part really. Collectively we might be something like this. So how do we continue to to understand our um, our impact and our potential in this system? And I hope um, I've given some ideas about what I think, certainly in the Australian context, are useful capabilities for, for where I think we need to head in the next five, ten years, and possibly you know well into our future. And I think um, I think it's possible, but I think it's layered, and I think it's going to require us a new form of thinking. Um, but we're capable. I mean, we're, we're in this space, we're in this room because we care. So just to sum up, it's up to us really. Let's build a future that we'd be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> um, before we open the floor up for a question, uh, maybe Shelley, you can also say a little bit about uh, the uh, transformation that you've seen, that you've instigated yeah. in Victoria um, in terms of a workforce development mm -hmm. and um, and how you, you know, what was the process that you undertook to uh, really shift hundreds of prevention mm -hmm. uh, workers mm -hmm. um, across communities in Victoria to become more active and capable uh, systems thinkers and systems actors? Mm -hmm. you know, tell us a little bit more about that, mm -hmm. uh, that journey. Yeah, so um, I remember it was between Christmas and New Year, which you know, most people take holidays then. I never, as a policy advisor, took holidays then. So it was the only time when, well, number one, I didn't have any, I had hundreds of staff, and hardly anyone was there. But it's also the time when the government's forming its plan and its strategy for the future, um, its economic, through its economic review process. So it's the time to really have good conversations with the minister and actually the politicians and actually say, hey, look, you know, really, if we were going to do something extraordinary in this state, here's what we might do. And I remember classic on the whiteboard designing a, this big intervention and it did kind of look like the classic system foresighting map and the spaghetti and squiggly lines and I remember asking the minister to come into my office and have a look and of course he just went and went and his immediate reaction was something along the lines that looks kind of like how political parties operate you know so much stuff happening but what I'd emphasize here was this was fun the intervention was about people was about the capability of our public health workforce we had an infrastructure out there which we could garner, but we needed to put new change agents in there with the full permission to change and disrupt the system. And I said, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that here politically and across all of the government portfolios. You've got to have my back. Um, I said, but I'll have everyone's back out in, in the system. Um, so we recruited and we designed those job descriptions for hundreds of positions, 250 positions, new positions in the system. Went out to a very different um, provider. Usually in health, you'd fund the health system to employ people and do stuff. This time we funded local government. It was quite quite unheard of to, to be the change agents and makers. But I, every job description, we, we crafted different types of capacities to work with business and industry, to work on communication science. And then we went on a mass national recruitment and had for some positions, 300 people applying. Like it was just quite overwhelming. So right from that moment it started, something different here and we specified system changing capabilities, dynamic, you know, you've got to be able to engage with people and be brave and take time out to iterate, work as part of a team. Um, so something was signalled and we marketed it really, we marketed it nationwide and we had incredible people um, applying for positions. And then myself and my, my senior team participated in the interviews out there across communities, supporting local governments to recruit and just, it was the most extraordinary experience. We then networked every single capability in were networked. So everyone was working part of a, as a, as part of a team statewide of 12, and then they were um, networked digitally, coming together, supported, trained. We'd have prevention exchanges where everyone across the system at one point, there was around 500 people in the room, learning, um, um, challenging, and um, having, having all different inputs to, to how their role could be. So that operated really for a good two and a half, three years. Um, and the shift in our system, I mean, people are still there, like they're everywhere. I call them sleeping agents. They're just everywhere at the moment and they're fantastic. I've managed to employ a couple of them. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it just showed people went, I remember there were moments in time where 
the first exchange where everyone was in the room, we did quick kind of you know, snappy little presentations around the room in different groups. And I saw, I was kind of walking around going, oh no, six months in and I'm seeing more of the same stuff. You know, I'm bored already. And, um, and then six months later, after massive injection of system thinking in a whole bunch of ways, including you, Terry, you were part of this. Um, I saw, I went and did, we did the same thing and I remember walking around the room and it was that moment of seeing these presentations, which was so extraordinary, where people were actually saying I probed, I sensed the system, this is what I saw, this is what else I did, this is how I went back to my community and just this change in language and thought and analysis and capacity to operate in the system and that just grew and grew and grew, that we had quite a, a powerful workforce, which was, was it really, right. it was the intervention. Yeah, and I think in many ways, uh, Health Futures Australia is timely and possible right now because that army is still there. Even though Healthy Together Victoria, <coughs> as a branded initiative, is no longer present, uh, the, much of the essence actually still is. Um, it's in the current, you know, uh, place-based, you know, prevention mm -hmm. plan, you know, that the new uh, government had put out, right? And yep. then the prevention workforce is spread, you know, throughout the state and, and the country, really. Um, and so those people who are making local decisions are able to uh, click, mm. you know, with uh, what Health uh, Futures Australia is uh, is proposing. Absolutely. Um, and so, mm. all right. Well, thank you so much. And let's open up uh, uh, the floor to a couple of questions, maybe. Um, I think we have like five, ten minutes. Alessandra. Thank you so much for speaking today. Uh, just thinking about how your social enterprise works and how you're sustainable in itself. And I was, and thinking about an example to apply it to. In the beginning, you mentioned how uh, food is shipped from Northern Australia down to the South to be packaged and then back up to the mm -hmm. South. Using that as an example, how would you be able to step in and, and figure out how to fix that? for a better change and how that contributes to your own model for your business to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, look, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily step in, but you know, the commu a community geared up, a wellbeing community would, it would have people that would step in. Um, so what we saw is, and I think it would be, I don't think there'd be anything too dissimilar to what we've seen done previously, which is, um, we had parent groups set up, we had conversations, dialogue interviews with supermarket owners, we had forums with everyone in the room saying, this is just ridiculous, we need to shift this, we need to change this. And so what it really meant was changing that kind of market demand and supply. So in fact, um, Healthy Together then sponsored a whole range of local producers to actually start selling roadside. To actually, you know, it's not rocket science, but how do you impact that food system? Actually, you start to bring it all back and bring it local. We had, um, we've got this phenomenon in Australia which is growing called the men's shed groups. And they're just extraordinary it's community groups. Loads of men are taking part. They're repairing, they're building bikes. They're doing a whole lot of social good. They started to build shelving to put in corner stores um, around uh, different parts of the community so that we could have fresh fruit and vegetables fully on display, front and centre, prominent in all the little corner stores, but particularly those that were targeted around schools and otherwise. So basically increased the demand locally, started to shift that system, had conversations um, with the supermarket retailers um, around can we, you know, what can we do, how can we shift this. We saw the supermarket retailers really taking part in it, but you know, constantly concerned of course about their profit and otherwise. Um, yeah, so I think it was, um, it, it's all about community demand really, community demand something, supply shifts over time. Mm. Good uh, Ayman? <coughs> Much of what you said resonates a lot with all of us uh, with the change of political system here in the United States. One of the boldest interventions uh, <clears throat> uh, trying to attempt to provide universal health care is being dismantled piece by piece. And uh, the question that comes to mind is you almost need to retrofit your evaluation plan to the political cycle, whether you like it or not. I mean, obviously it's inspirational what you say, but unfortunately we are hostage of uh, the idiosyncrasies of the political force. Mm -hmm. And um, much of what you describe is, is hard to even predict how long it would take to really fully manifest change mm -hmm. because 
some of these interventions are new, so mm -hmm. maybe the next generation will know. Uh, but, but at the same time, we are forced to show efficacy for two reasons. Number one, in order to be able to protect the intervention from the next cycle of political onslaught, and second, to assist the community in embracing the intervention as something that's useful to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm almost tempted to put the evaluation in the beginning, not in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that the slide that you have, the very complex slide that you have, really belongs to the very, very early part of your presentation mm -hmm. and the intervention itself, mm -hmm. because it takes so long to evaluate anything and leave it almost as an, as an empty space to be filled by reality <laughs> at the pace that reality indicates mm -hmm. rather than an expectation of when evaluation steps in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. A great point. And I think, um, I mean... <sighs> That's true for Healthy Together, uh, Victoria. We it, retrofitted how many times? How many times? <laughs> and even I think about it now, and um, we've got developmental evaluators as much as we can as a not-for-profit, afford for there to be, immersed right up front across everything, everything we do. It's quite a, quite exciting, really. And um, but, but as you say, you know, um, I mean, it's just it's just quite fascinating to look at evaluation and how it's how it's emerging and where we're going to head with this because I think it's, you know, I'm finding one of the most powerful forms of evaluation is um, narratives and stories. Um, and how does that figure in this? And I'm finding that the attention at a community level of decision makers and otherwise politicians um, is very much responding to their real lived experience stories. So how we thread this much more strongly, I think, um, is another challenge that we have that I agree. I can A logic model can come in anywhere. I mean, that logic model was yeah. done before the work was even you know, garnered really in terms of, but you're right, we're, we're constantly changing. In, in Australia too, that I think mm. one of the biggest critics uh, of this retrofitting, um, you know, exercise, which was happening, uh, really came from public health academics mm. in Australia. Mm. They were very um, uh, against uh, this, you know, retrofitting uh, uh, process um, because they were, they had a mental model of what the outcomes ought to be. Mm. Um, and to the extent that the program wasn't showing the outcome, the preconceived outcomes, they weren't willing to accept, you know, newly emerging evidence mm. uh, that came out of the retrofit evaluation. Is, so right. it goes to show um, that there's much work to be done within sure. public health. Sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's so, some good ones there. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, maybe one more question. Yes, uh, Margaret. Um, you mentioned businesses, and I'm thinking large corporations and banks. How, can you talk a little bit about how you motivate them to become equal partners in this? Like mm. you, you seem to imply that it was an interest in participating. Can you elaborate yeah. on that? Yeah, um, it's very different. Uh, we've, we've got multiple case studies of difference there. So it's the kind of... Um, there's the national, it's the big, like Westpac, who I'm a social change fellow with, is a really interesting one. And, you know, they've got a corporate social program, a shared value program. They're investing, you know, um, they've got a, a Westpac scholars program. So they're kind of doing some really considered work. Um, but I think it is that, that conversation around that shared value that goes that next level in the system, next level in the system. That's, that's hard. And I think that's happening now in Australia. And I think that there is a, a, new, a new emergence, really, business and industry kind of thinking much more around their role and responsibility in initiating and creating change. Um, at a community level, so at a regional level, for example, I'm working with um, one group who are kind of like the peak body for all of the big, um, 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 I'm, I'm hesitant in saying big when I'm in the US, <laughs> big in the Australian context, but big regional employers. So for example, 100 of the biggest regional employers in one of those case studies um, uh, we're working with around signing an accord, really, around the top three interventions they want to do. Now, for example, at least three of those are very big players in the food industry, um, junk food industry, and in um, you know, high energy dense food production industry. So this is a fantastic and fascinating conversation in and around, you know, again, theory you, we're all present in this. You know, the public health person five years ago, I wouldn't have had the conversations I'm having now, probably I've been a bit more fired up. Now it's kind of like, come on, this is so big, this is so complex, we have to work together. So there's a sense, yeah, it, it, I mean, it just depends. It's so much based on values, it's so much based on um, caring, but the data is so powerful now. 
Australian business care is, is activating around climate change and I believe it's starting to activate around things like you know, the, the physical health and wellbeing. Um, mental health and wellbeing is number one priority for a lot of Australian business now. Obesity, less so. We've got a bit more of a battle on our hands, I think. So it's quite, quite different and it all depends. It comes down to that leader often, that leader who signals to the organisation, we'll lead, we'll com commit, we'll invest. Um, we will get, for example, in a community of 100,000 people, we will have aimed to have a dialogue interview with probably the eight most likely investors, a health insurer, a bank, uh, potentially um, the hospital and health service is often the biggest budget holder in a community and biggest employer. Um, then bring them in what we call a co-investment round table to do some co-design around what can an investment model look like for the community and then eventually land on them investing in the model that they've co-designed. That's a, that's a theory of change so that we're not going to them with a polished proposition. We're involving them in the design of what's possible. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.